Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. This is Dr. Gandhi. Today's question asks, why is narcissism considered so dangerous? So another question I've heard that's kind of related to this is, why are narcissists formidable? So I'll try to answer this question by looking at the seven reasons that narcissism is dangerous. So if we look at narcissism, we know that it's not popular by accident. We see a lot of research on narcissism. If you look at the quantity of literature, it's really second only to borderline personality disorder in terms of looking at the studies of personality traits. We see a lot of interest recently in the dark triad, and this would be narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism appearing together in one person. And we also have the dark tetrad, which adds subclinical sadism to the dark triad. So if you take narcissism alone, and then you add the dark triad and the dark tetrad, we see even more research. Really, again, a massive quantity of research. And in that research, we have a lot of information about the characteristics of narcissism. We also see repeated warnings from scientists as to the danger and prevalence of narcissism and characteristics that kind of run together with narcissism, again, like the dark triad and the dark tetrad. So we also see a lot of blogs on the internet and YouTube channels. A number of channels are dedicated exclusively to narcissism. So we see literally thousands of videos on YouTube about narcissism. Now, I've talked about the narcissism channels, as I call them before, and some of them really aren't that effective, some of them don't have accurate information, but all these channels could not have come into existence if narcissism wasn't real. Like, they might not get the problem illustrated correctly all the time, in my opinion, but they are talking about a real problem. Narcissism is a real thing. And it worries me that so many channels kind of turn to personal experience and not the research literature. But again, either way, that doesn't mean that narcissism isn't a problem. I think the channels exist because narcissism is a problem. The media did not create the demand for all this content on narcissism. It wasn't the content on narcissism first and then the outrage second. It worked the other way around. People who suffer at the hands of narcissists realized that something was wrong, realized that this must represent a pattern, the behavior that they were experiencing must be contained in some sort of framework that can be understood and then they found out that there was a name for it, narcissism. It's a set of personality traits. It's a real thing. And that really drove this interest in the construct. Now moving to the seven reasons that narcissism is dangerous. So the first one is that narcissism doesn't tend to change. Again, it's a set of personality traits. So personality is actually remarkably stable over the lifetime. So if somebody's narcissistic when they're 20 years old, the overwhelming probability is that they will be narcissistic when they're 70 years old. Now, what about mental health care? I hear this a lot. Well, maybe the mental health counselors and other related professions can come to the rescue. This is really their domain. We have, after all, a narcissistic personality disorder. Why can't counselors just diagnose that and treat this problem out of existence, right? Treat people, it'll go away, and narcissism will be gone, and everybody will be satisfied. Well, the problem is that NPD, Narcissistic Personality Disorder, is only diagnosed when we see extreme grandiose traits. So narcissism has two types, grandiose and vulnerable, and both are dangerous. And even when we're looking at somebody who has grandiose traits, we see that counselors often miss the diagnosis altogether, or they misdiagnose. Now, if somebody has vulnerable narcissism, there is no mental disorder that goes along with that. So it's either missed altogether, or a person's diagnosed with something like borderline personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, or paranoid personality disorder. Now, all those are real personality disorders, but the treatment protocol for those disorders, the kind of treatment that counselors would use, is different than what we would use for narcissistic personality disorder. So we really have to know what somebody has. We really have to have the right diagnosis in order to deliver effective treatment. Another problem here is even when we see NPD is diagnosed correctly, it is treatment resistant. Often people with NPD 
work on other symptoms, not the symptoms related to narcissism. So they might come in for substance use disorder and may also have NPD, but again, they'll just be treated for the substance problem. So the mental health treatment community can't maneuver us away from the problem of narcissism. I think counselors and related professionals can help, but we really can't do enough without wider awareness and action on the issue of narcissism. Moving on to the second reason why narcissism is dangerous. We see that a number of narcissists in interpersonal situations, that's where the damage is really done, are willing to do just about anything to protect their own ego, right? So they can be reckless, they can be vindictive, and when they're vindictive, this desire for revenge can be seemingly endless. So if we make an analogy here, if we draw an analogy over to like a soldier, one of the most dangerous combatants would be a soldier who's willing to do anything, who's not frightened by anything. A soldier who's willing to die in order to kill somebody else. And in a sense, narcissists kind of share this fearlessness component. They believe they are justified. They believe they're moral. They're right. They're fighting the good fight. And they won't respond to reason. So a good soldier, of course, would respond to reason. So narcissists move away here in this analogy. They're separate. And of course, this is one of the things that makes them really dangerous. A narcissist is a dangerous adversary. We also see that narcissism is associated with criminal activity and substance use, which itself is associated with criminal activity. So a lot of reasons here to fear narcissism. Reason number three, narcissism is spreading. It's on the rise. And we see this repeatedly in the research literature. Although there is some research that disputes this, most researchers would agree narcissism is increasing. We're seeing an increase overall, and we're seeing more instances of severe or extreme narcissism. And I think there's a number of reasons why narcissism is spreading. I think one reason is that narcissistic parents are typically bad parents, and bad parents tend to cause people to be narcissistic. They tend to raise narcissistic children. So narcissism leads to more narcissism directly in this way. So it's not contagious like an illness would be, like a medical illness, for instance, but it still spreads. It still has a mechanism so that it moves throughout a population. Now, in a more subtle way, narcissism can lead to other narcissistic qualities, right? Not necessarily traits, but states. And repeated states sometimes end up being traits, right? So if somebody's angry frequently with state anger, they can develop trait anger. And I think what we see here sometimes is people look at the success of narcissists and they think to themselves, maybe this is the way to go. Maybe being nice and reasonable and worrying about other people's best interest isn't practical. Another thing is not everybody's repulsed by narcissists, right? People see narcissism, and again, they see that they're successful, and they mimic people who succeed. So in a sense, they're attracted to narcissists. And narcissists, of course, like that and encourage that behavior. Moving on to number four, narcissism causes direct harm. The research literature is extremely clear about this. Narcissism exposure causes a massive amount of stress, and stress really can't be underestimated in terms of the damage it can cause. It causes depression, all types of anxiety, including panic. It can even cause obsessive compulsive symptoms. And of course, it can lead people to use substances. Now, in terms of other disorders, we see adjustment disorder. So people who are exposed to someone who's narcissistic may develop adjustment disorder. And a lot of times adjustment disorder is thought of as not serious, kind of a trivial diagnosis, but nothing could be further from the truth. Adjustment disorder can be devastating. Now we've seen recent interest in labeling the effects of a narcissist, labeling those effects on people as a disorder. And there is no disorder exclusively that kind of captures what victims go through when they're exposed to a narcissist. But there are some theories that it can lead to symptoms that are similar to what we see with post-traumatic stress disorder or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So again, just looking at all these different symptoms and problems that can be caused through narcissism exposure, narcissism causes harm. It's dangerous in a direct, unequivocal manner that really can't be denied when you take a close look at the evidence. Reason number five has to do with work settings. Narcissism causes companies to lose good workers 
and productivity. So narcissists, especially when they reach like management or supervisory positions, demoralize staff. They erode confidence. They're unfair to workers. They are poor managers. They're just not effective at being productive. And they don't care about company goals, only their own goals. But they are driven to gain power. And sometimes determination is all somebody needs to move up in an organization. Simply trying repeatedly is an incredibly successful tactic for being promoted. Narcissists intimidate people into not complaining. They victimize a large number of people, especially over time. But people won't come forward and make a complaint. And if they do make a complaint, they won't follow through with it. That's because narcissists, again, tend to be vindictive. They tend to retaliate. So they pressure victims. They pressure people that they have been unjust to. And those people often just quit. They don't bother with it. Again, they rarely stay and fight. And this is, interestingly, often the advice of other people. If somebody goes home to their family or they go see their friends after work and they say, I'm having trouble with a narcissist at work, a lot of people will say, just give up. Just leave that work setting. And I think one of the reasons is because in romantic relationships, when we see narcissism, this is often the advice. If somebody's been with a narcissist for many years, a lot of friends and family will say, just leave that person. And of course, that can come with its own set of complexities. But for whatever reason, people think it's easier sometimes to leave work, which I don't think is true. Work provides income, and it provides, of course, therefore, all these material goods. Work is important. People just can't walk away from jobs. A lot of the time, they're stuck with a narcissist in a work setting, just like they might be stuck with a romantic partner. So again, family and friends might say, you don't want trouble, it's not worth it, don't rock the boat. Often companies really have the same lines that they promote to employees. And being narcissistic isn't technically against the law. Now, perhaps acting in a narcissistic way should be. And of course, there are some instances where I suppose it would be. But again, normally it's not. So even when a narcissist is fired, even when a company doesn't want somebody who's narcissistic working for them, right, especially if they have pronounced narcissistic behaviors, not just the personality traits that are subtle, but the obvious behaviors, even when they're fired, they go to work somewhere else, right? There's no criminal record. There's no narcissism record, right? So the next employer, the next person interviewing that narcissist isn't going to know about the trail of destruction, the narcissistic trail of destruction that that narcissist left behind them, right? They don't see it. They don't know about it. And of course, when companies call for references, nobody's going to say, oh yeah, they were narcissistic because everybody's afraid of getting sued. So the system ends up protecting narcissists. Now, I understand, of course, why employers shouldn't reveal information about people. I don't think the answer here is to just have anybody say anything. We certainly don't want to encourage defamation and we don't want employers to have a lot of power over employees that left. But something does need to be done, right? There is a loophole here that narcissists really can drive right through. I mean, you could drive an aircraft carrier through this, right? So a huge loophole. They can get fired for wrongdoing and pop up in supervisory roles of the companies with no limitations, with no obstacles. Now moving on to reason number six why narcissism is dangerous. This mostly has to do with work as well, but this could also do with like large social institutions, right? Anytime there's a lot of people together and narcissists are kind of loose in the population. Narcissism has a low critical mass for toxicity. So think about this as compared to other extreme personality traits. If somebody's in an organization and the organization has a hundred people working for it and five of those people have really high agreeableness, too high, right? They're too trusting. They do whatever people tell them. They don't really demonstrate a conviction to their beliefs. They kind of go with whatever other people say, right? That's dangerous, right? That can be risky to an organization. But five people out of a hundred with high agreeableness probably wouldn't finish the company off, right? That could be survivable because the organization could place those really agreeable people in positions where agreeableness is valued. The same thing with extroversion. High extroversion can be really dangerous. Extroverts tend to take a lot of risks. But five extroverts in a large company, even ten, would necessarily be problematic. Maybe they're moved to an area like sales, where people typically think that extroverts do well. Although, interestingly, research shows extroverts don't do any better than introverts in sales. But either way, a lot of people believe that. So maybe they're moved to sales. 
and the damage that they can do there would be contained. The damage they could do to the company there would be contained. Now, if we look at something like low openness to experience, it's the same thing. Somebody has a real rigid belief system. They don't like theory or abstraction. There are many jobs in a company that they could do without causing any type of havoc. Low conscientiousness is a little more challenging. If you had five or ten people that were really disorganized and didn't really care about doing good work, and they weren't like deliberate in their actions, that could be problematic. But again, maybe survivable. You would probably put those people in roles where not a lot is at stake, right? Whatever those roles would be in the company. So the critical mass for those personality traits I talked about, for the extreme manifestations of those traits, would be maybe 10 or 15 people. Right? If you had 10 or 15 out of 100, that could be problematic. The critical mass with narcissism could be one person. Right? If it's the wrong person in the organization, if it's the owner or somebody with a lot of power, again, just one person could do a lot of damage. That would be the critical mass for toxicity. Certainly, if you had five people in a company of 100, this would be problematic. And if you had 10 or 15, that would be, I think, in most situations, unsustainable. Now, it depends on what the company does. But if there's any type of interacting with other companies or the public, that would be a lot of narcissist for a company to absorb, right? A lot of behaviors they would have to explain to customers. There'd be a lot of apologizing going on. And a lot of people who would just be leaving, who wouldn't be giving their business to that company. So again, with narcissism, just a little bit goes a long way. It can cause a lot of havoc, a lot of destruction in any type of social structure where people are working toward a common goal. And then moving to the seventh reason that narcissism is dangerous. This is the last reason I'll go over here. Narcissism is insidious. It's often silent or very quiet. It's hard to detect. It usually doesn't have a physical component, like a narcissist doesn't have to hit somebody physically to do damage to them. Narcissists tend to lie a lot, pathological lying, and they're really quite effective at lying. They're quite convincing. Narcissists also often use really simple tricks to avoid being held responsible. For example, if they're accused of something, they might develop a memory problem all of a sudden, right? They won't remember what they said. They'll often issue counter accusations, right? So really, again, kind of a simple trick, but it can be effective. If somebody accuses them of something, they're going to accuse that person of something else. Maybe it's related, or maybe it's something else. But if you think about this, this type of trick really shouldn't work. And it's amazing to me that it does, right? It's fairly common with narcissism. And again, it's an effective tactic. Let's look at an analogy where somebody owns a store. And let's say they are in a jurisdiction where the owner of a store is allowed to detain somebody who shoplifts from that store. So somebody comes into the store and they steal like a bag of potato chips. So they run out of the door and the owner chases them and catches them and calls the police. So the police show up and the owner of the store says, look, this guy took this bag of potato chips and I caught him, right? I caught him shoplifting. And I'd like you to arrest him. Maybe there's video to support that, maybe not, but usually the police would take action in that type of situation. So how effective would it be if that shoplifter looked at the police officer after the shop owner said his piece? And the shoplifter said, you know, this was my bag of potato chips first. It was at my house, and the owner of this store came to my house, took the bag of potato chips, and put it on the shelf in his store. That would make no sense. The police officer wouldn't buy that for a second. Yet narcissists do the same type of counter-accusation nonsense every day. And again, it's very effective. It's the word of one person against that of the narcissist. And other witnesses usually don't want to come forward to support the victim, the person who's the victim of narcissism, because again, they don't want the wrath of the narcissist. So really, the narcissist has forced, has coerced the silence of other people that could help the victim. On top of this, when we look at the management of many organizations, they tend to look at the arguments between narcissist and victims of narcissist as really a personality clash, right? A miscommunication, a misunderstanding. And this is a plausible explanation for when two people don't get along, if there isn't a pattern. But again, narcissists do this repeatedly. So it's kind of amazing to me this gets missed so often in organizations. Again, it's just dismissed as two people who are arguing. And this can be easy to do if 
the management of an organization doesn't understand narcissism. And I think that's really kind of one of the main points of this video on the seven reasons why narcissism is dangerous. To increase the awareness of narcissism. And again, this is the same increase in awareness that scientists have been calling for in the research literature. Right? This is a problem that we know about. This is a problem that mental health counselors see every day. So it's important to raise awareness. Narcissism and the damage they cause is not trivial. It may sound trivial at first. Oh, that person is narcissistic. But when you really dig into it, when you really explore the damage that narcissists cause in work settings and romantic relationships and other social settings, it's really a horrible scourge, right? Narcissism is a scourge upon our society. It's a serious business. And we need to accurately identify it, and we need to try to treat it. And again, I mentioned perhaps the role of mental health counseling in this, but we also need really members of the general public to take lawful and helpful action to protect people from narcissists. And this type of action can be started with something really simple. Organizations, people who have leadership positions in organizations, simply listening to people who say they're victims of narcissists, exploring the construct, learning about narcissism, and evaluating whether those people are correct, right? Investigating it properly, believing that somebody who's narcissistic could in fact do damage. So I know whenever I talk about narcissism and dangerousness, there will be a variety of opinions, people who agree with me and disagree with me, and have examples from their own experiences, examples when they encountered a narcissist, or maybe someone who is a narcissist kind of recollects what they did to other people, right? Again, a lot of different experiences. Please put those opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of narcissism and dangerousness to be interesting. Thanks for watching.